Good afternoon. Um, hello to everybody I've not met before. My name is Jake. I'm currently a trainee uh, at QMC in Nottingham. And the reason I'm stood in front of you is because I completed my FEM training over in the West Midlands last August. Um, and I've been asked to come and give you an oversight of kind of what that was, how I, that experience was for me. And for the trainees in the audience who are interested in a career in pure emergency medicine, the best way to go about doing that or rather how I went about doing that. Now, it's a bit of a mouthful, pre emergency medicines. I'm going to refer to it as FEM for the rest of the talk, if that's okay. So what I thought I would do today is I'm going to talk about two cases fairly pre briefly, but they're cases that I think highlight quite nicely the added value that FEM as a specialty brings to our patients, and hopefully I'll dispel a couple of myths about the specialty as well. I'm going to talk to you about what my training was like, um, some of the benefits that I got from it, but also importantly, how to go about applying for um, subspecialty training. And I'm going to finish off with talking about a couple of important organisations, Photon and FEMTA, because um, we love our acronyms and FEM, and uh, give you a bit more information about how you can get more involved with these, uh, these organisations. Okay, so the first case. I've been really vague about the details of these. I'm very conscious of confidentiality. But there's a middle-aged man um, who very sadly had tried to set himself on fire um, as a suicide attempt. The pre-alert we had was he had 80% total body surface area burns. And this fell into what we would call an immediate dispatch criteria. So when someone calls 999, the call takers will then go through a system and either a HEMS team will get immediately dispatched based on the clinical information or the call will be interrogated by a desk before we're dispatched. But certainly with something like this, we'd be sitting to straight away. The update we had from scene was that the fire had been put out, but the crew on scene were requesting an enhanced care team. And that's referring to a doctor paramedic team that supports the ambulance service and doing a fantastic job that they do. So on the way to any kind of job, we always have a think about where we're going to go with the patient and how we're going to get them there. This patient clearly needed a burn centre. It was about 50 minutes away by land and 40 minutes by air. And the reason there was such a um, similarity between those distances is we always seem to forget about how long it takes us to load patients onto an aircraft and get them to hospital. And we couldn't land anywhere near the scene. So actually there probably wasn't really any benefit in us going by air with this patient. And that's often the case, particularly in our region. So we tend not to fly many patients to hospital. So we arrived on scene. Um, no catastrophic hemorrhage. The airway was our major concern. There was loads of soot, loads of swelling, there was burns to the face, and had impending airway compromise. Probably had a chemical lung injury, along with some circumferential burns to the chest, so there were ventilatory insufficiency. The patient was tachycardic, hypo, hypertensive, but there was no indication that there was any trauma. So we weren't worried that they were hypovolemic at that stage. Rather upsettingly, they were conscious and in agony and conversing with us. And the burns estimation we'd been given over the phone had been accurate. The crew had given some oxygen um, and put some burns dressing on, but had struggled to do much else at that stage because of the severity of his injury. So what did we bring as a, as a pre-hostile team to this job? Well, the theme for all of this is going to be we just helped the ambulance service do the basics well, really. So we gave some oxygen, we got some access, we gave some analgesia. And recognising the severity of these injuries, we knew this is probably a terminal event. So we took the time to speak to the patient, ask him if he had anything he wanted to say to his family, make sure that information was passed on. I'm really pleased we did that. And I hope that the family found some value and comfort in that before we moved on to anaesthetise the patient. Now... I guess what I'm trying to point, make a point from this whole slide is that we haven't done anything clever or anything particularly invasive, and we certainly haven't done anything that any emergency department couldn't do. And my take home really is that there are a cohort of patients out there who do need an enhanced care team at scene because they're too unwell to get to hospital, but it's not about us staying on scene, doing loads of stuff certainly stuff that can be done in hospital. Everything we do needs to be meaningful, and we just do enough to get the patient to hospital safely. And we peer review a lot of our work to make sure that we're not overstepping this mark. 
The other thing is the human humanitarian considerations for this patient. And I think anaesthetizing him out of hospital was probably the right thing. So the second case was a young lad who had been hit by a bus. He was trapped under the bus, and this, um, again, hit our immediate dispatch criteria. Rather concerningly, there was reports of a bowel evisceration, so the mechanism and the energy of the trauma was quite severe, and he was still trapped there. We knew we had to go to paediatric MTC. The geography was terrible for where the, where the scene was, and it was a good 55 minutes by land. It was a rush hour during the day as well. Um, so flight was probably going to be a bit quicker. So if this patient was time critical, which you thought they were, there might have been merit in flying. So moving on to the primary survey when we arrived on scene. So there was no external catastrophic hemorrhage. The patient had a patent area, was talking to us. Um, a little bit confused, but there's no obvious chest injury. The SATs were unrecordable. The patient was severely shocked. And for a paediatric patient, as you all know, being that shocked so early on means they're decompensating, they're really peri-arrest. Slightly obtunded, not unsurprisingly, with the mechanism and the shock status, but still trapped under that wheel arch. The ambulance crew done a fantastic job at getting venous access and we're very grateful for that given how shocked the patient was. So they're given some analgesia, give us some oxygen. But our main concerns really at this point was this patient was peri arrest. They needed to be out immediately, um, but they were still trapped. And I guess, you know, what did we bring to this scene? Well, the fire service had put their pneumatic lifters under the bus. They tried to lift the vehicle. The patient was still trapped. And we gave the fire service permission to cause that patient more harm slightly and perhaps some discomfort. But if we didn't get him out immediately, then things were going to deteriorate further. They had sent for what we call tech rescue, which is a specialist branch of the fire service. Um, they were going to be another 15, 20 minutes, and we just didn't have that amount of time. But once the patient was out, all we did was assist the ambulance service in just doing the basics really well. So we put a binder on, pulled the femurs, gave some fluids, because we weren't carrying blood at that stage, gave some TXA, and got the child to hospital as quickly as possible. And the reason I've chosen this case is two, re two things that I think we added here. An entrapment isn't a common thing for a crew to see um, in the ambulance service. They'll go to maybe one or two a year. Um, we do get tasked these a bit more frequently, so we added some experience to that on scene. But I think the real value for this patient was we were able to get him to hospital much quicker than he would have been otherwise. So thank you for listening to the clinical side. Um, I just wanted to present those cases to highlight the value that FEM, in my opinion, brings to scene. And I think we do, sometimes there's a bit of a bad, bad rep for FEM, and there's certainly been scenarios where patients have had more done on scene than they needed to get to hospital. But I think there are some patients out there who do have value from having an enhanced care team coming to them. And there are some patients who do need to be flown to hospital, and it's not frequent. The vast majority of the cases, the value that um, the HEM service offers is getting us to scene, but we do have those time critical patients every now and again. So the rest of the talk is going to be for the trainees in the audience who are interested in FEM as a career. Um, I'm going to give you an oversight as to what my training was like, um, why I enjoyed it so much, and some tips about how, if you are interested, you can um, spin your CV up getting ready for an application. So it is a GMC-approved subspecialty training program. Um, it's available for any of the acute care specialties, so ACCS specialties. Um, and I've put military GP at the bottom there in brackets because in the regular military, um, there are two FEM numbers available for GPs at the moment. This isn't an option available for civilian practice. So all anaesthetists in the audience, um, and ACCS is probably the best way to go if you are an ACCS, ACCS trainee, then you have all of these competence, all these placements that are required to apply for FEM. But it's not a deal breaker. I didn't do ACCS, I did core anaesthetics. It just means you need to go back and cover some of these other specialties, the ED particularly, and I've put acute medicine in brackets because it's not currently on the person's spec for applications, but it will be from the next round of applications. So you need to think about these out of program experiences that you need to arrange in advance of applying for FEM. 
It's a bit of a putting all your eggs in one basket. It's not like ITU where you can apply, get the number, and then go back and do these, these other specialties. You need to do them before you apply. I don't expect you to read the slides. Um, the point for this really is just to highlight that the vast majority of what's required for an application are courses. And you just need to think about what courses you need to do before you need to apply. And they need to be in date by the time that you interview. And they're really strict about this. There have been people who've had their ATLS or whatever trauma certificate two days out of date and then they've not been in, able to interview on the day. So think about what courses you need, when they will expire, and where you can fit them into your training with your study leave and budget allowance. But there is one aspect of this which is really difficult to get exposure to, and that's some clinical exposure in FEM. And it's a bit of a chicken and the egg scenario. How do I get clinical exposure when most of these services require you to be able to do some of it already? So what I wanted to do is give you a quick overview in the East Midlands, some of the options that are available to us. Um, my email address will be at the end, so if there's anybody who wants more information about these at the end, then please feel free to email me. So I need to start off by talking about the West Midlands Care Team. So they are an organisation over in Birmingham. They will take trainees who have got no experience in FEM. They will take you on as one of their trainees and they'll train you up to one of their clinical lead standards. Um, that's how I started and I can't recommend this organisation enough. It's a great group of individuals um, doing a fantastic job over in the West Mids and you will really get a taste of what FEM is about. And just as importantly, it might also be the opportunity for you to realise it's not for you. And knowing at this stage, or that stage, I think is really important. Some of you may have heard of basics organisations. They are individuals, doctors, nurses, paramedics who respond in their own time with their own vehicles, they're blue light trained. And the basis organisation in the East Midlands is called EMIX. And they often take people along for observerships if you want to get in contact with them. And that's a great way to kind of see the other side of uh, pre emergency medicine. The ambulance service, uh, of course, EMAS, um, community first responder aspects of EMAS. Uh, they're always looking for people to get more involved with that. That would be a really great way to get an idea of the basic aspects of how the ambulance service works. And of course, there's a St. John's ambulance service as well, who will take people on. And they often provide cover for many of these uh, music and community-based events. And don't forget, we've got Donington Racetrack on our doorstep as well. They have loads of motorsports commitments there, and they're always looking for individuals to get involved. And again, I've got contacts for these if anybody would like them at the end. So the next few slides are just going to talk about where it would fit into your training, what my training was like, and I'm going to finish off by talking about those two organisations at the end. So at the moment, it will fit in towards your ST6 seven years. Training is changing. The ST5 and 4 is going to become the intermediate training, so I think FEM will probably sit in the same place. It might be that it will become a post-CCT accreditation. The jury's still out on that, but regardless, it's going to be towards the end of your training. Now, the East Midlands doesn't have a FEM number at the moment, um, so I'm going to talk to you about my experiences over in the West Midlands um, and how much I enjoyed it over there. So. I did six months with Midlands Ambulance and then six months at Stoke MTC and then I cycled through and I did six months at an air ambulance a bit closer to home and six months at Coventry MTC. And the reason that I think Westmead is a fantastic place to do FEM is that those are two really busy HEM services but just as importantly you get to work at two major trauma centres outside of your region and the opportunities that that gives you in the the knowledge and the skills and the uh, seeing how other departments work is so invaluable. I think it's really worth considering if you're looking to do FEM to consider going to the West Mids. Now this page, I'll just talk you through this very quickly. Um, this is just to give an overview of what you'd expect kind of your day-to-day -day work to be like. Um, you'd see over a year about 300 or so patients, but that equates to about 600 plus incidents. So it's really common to be sent to something and be stood down or to get on scene and not be needed. And I really struggled with that initially. It was frustrating because I wanted to see patients, I wanted to treat patients, and you need to understand that that's not how the job works, and there's a lot of sitting around, waiting. And sometimes, you know, an average of three incidents per shift, so there were days where we didn't get tasked to anything. And some 
trainees I've worked with couldn't, just couldn't deal with that. It was just it was too frustrating for them and they dropped out of the programme. So you need to kind of go into it knowing that this is the reality of it. The other downside is to do with the assessments. So 130 workplace-based assessments as a bare minimum over a 12-month period. And the reason there are so many to do is that there's over a 1,000 curriculum items that need to be mapped. And they need to be mapped twice. It's really laborious and it takes hours of your day, every day, doing this logbook. Um, but it's the only way through. So it's entirely necessary. Okay, so last two slides. Photon. So trainee research like collaboratives are really popular, really fashionable at the moment. It won't surprise you to know that FEM has one of their own, um, aptly named Photon. Um, these research collaboratives um, have variable amounts of outputs. Photon's really busy. We've got a couple of things submitted to BAJ, something to EMJ. We've got a dispatch study ongoing, which has never been done before across the UK. Um, and we've got ethical approval, uh, well, we've put ethics in for a silver trauma project. The point I'm trying to make is that this organisation is manned and staffed by really motivated people. They get stuff done. And if you're interested in getting involved, I'll give you some information in the next slide about how to do so. We really need motivated, interested people to get more involved and to help develop studies and to be involved with our ongoing studies. So please let us know. And then FEMTA, so the FEM Training Association. Um, it's trainee-led association. It represents the interests of all of the FEM trainees across the UK at a board level for the faculty, for the intercollegiate board of training, and also for the curriculum. But most importantly, we have a really important welfare role. FEM training is stressful. Um, resilience is an issue. Um, burnout's an issue. And FEMS is really there to support trainees. But for those in the audience who are interested in FEM, I guess what you'd be most interested in is a newsletter that we write every two months and it gives an overview of courses, educational events, the way ch training is changing, the curriculum, examinations um, and if you would like to receive that newsletter um, the QR code on the right is how you'll sign up for that. Now for the people at the back on the middle rows it won't reach from there so we'll leave this up in the break but if you would like to receive that newsletter and it's a great way to keep on top of understanding how FEM is progressing and it's the kind of thing they'd expect to interview to have that kind of understanding and knowledge. The QR code on the left is if you would like to get involved with Photons, the research network. It will sign you up and again we'll leave this up at the end in the break um, if you want to uh, take snapshots of those. And finally my email address is at the bottom there. Anybody who is genuinely interested and would like more information I'm happy to provide that to meet up to discuss further. So I hope that was helpful, I hope that was interesting. Um, I was trying to give an overview of why I think FEM has value and it has a trainee, how you can get more involved if you would like to and what the training was like for me. I've loved it, it's been fantastic, I've really enjoyed it. Um, it's great being back in the East Midlands, um, but the West Midlands training was superb. Um, thank you very much um, and I'd welcome any questions, please.